And we just completed with the first segment on the entrepreneur in that, where we found a little bit more about the entrepreneur. Now we move to the second segment, which is the entrepreneur expose. This is the segment where we find out a little bit more about how the entrepreneurs started the businesses, the challenges, and also what they look forward to in their new venture. First question uh, in the entrepreneur expose segment, what is your first entrepreneurial venture? Um, good question. I think, uh, to be honest, it probably was music. Uh, I was a student in the UK, um, and uh, every musician, in a sense, it has to be an entrepreneur because you're doing things DIY, you're creating music, you're creating a product, you're packaging yourself, you're putting yourself out there. So what you'd find is people from the music business um, probably understand, entre well, I don't know if they understand business, but they understand how to be uh, entrepreneurial in the sense that you gotta go out, you gotta find gigs, you gotta go to managers, you gotta, you gotta knock on doors and you gotta really uh, 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 push yourself. So I was doing that when I was 15 years old. I was just going out and pushing music and, and, and starting to do things that were, were around the music sphere. Okay, what was the most challenging, difficult thing being a 15-year-old pushing music in the industry of an entrepreneurial musician? I suppose the most difficult thing was uh, trying to understand how the whole system worked. You can't expect that uh, things work a certain way and all fall on the floor for you. You have to understand that big corporations sometimes work in different ways. Small corporations, businesses work in different ways, managers work in different ways, TV stations. And you have to kind of uh, be a chameleon. You have to understand that, okay, you don't go knocking on some manager's door like Brian Eno, like I did. Brian Eno produced, uh, who produced U2 and said, hey, I'm in town, let's meet up, <laughs> you know? He's like, yeah, no, no, let's not. <laughs> so you have, to be, you have to be realistic. And sometimes that realism is the hardest thing you have to deal with as an entrepreneur. People all want to start businesses, all want to do amazing things. But yet there are, there's, there's work involved, a lot of work and a lot of steps. And you have to go through step one, two, three, four, five, all the way. You can't just start being an entrepreneur right away. You have to work you know, and, and, and fight in the trenches. It was so difficult being an entrepreneur. I mean, what has kept you going all these years, especially in such a difficult business such as music? It's, it's also rewarding and it's exciting. Uh, you know, music, I was very lucky when I uh, came back. I was in the UK pushing, pushing, trying to score some deals, had some publishing offers, things like that. Eventually, my dad called me and said, hey, come back to, come back to Malaysia and let's get you a real job. I was like, uh, I'm doing an MBA. He's like, oh, good. <laughs> my dad's Chinese. So he's like, good, good, MBA, good, good, do, do, do MBA. So I did an MBA and tried to play more music. Um, eventually, I, I, I finished my MBA and then my dad said, okay, come back now. There's no more, right? What are you going to do, a PhD next? <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll come back. I came back. Luckily enough, I met up with a few producers and uh, Synchrosound Studios and I, I did my first album. And um, after that, things took off. I had a hit and then I, I started to, to work the ground. I started to get a lot of gigs. Uh, worked on my second album, started to produce more, more bands. But um, all the while, to be honest with you, though I was being entrepreneurial, I believe, I didn't quite, un I didn't quite focus on the business model. Um, I left that to my manager uh, slash CEO of Fat Boys. We, we had set up a company, Fat Boys. And my manager, uh, my, um, my manager became the CEO, Nick. And we just rolled out and we did, he handled the business and I handled the creative side. As an entrepreneur, I only wanted to do creative, creative stuff. So I said, look, I'll be in the studio doing music, you handle the business. Um, not, not wise, because if you're going to be an entrepreneur and going to have ownership business, you should know what's happening in your business end to end. You should know from the very bottom, all the way to the top, all the way to the high level financials, all the way to the five year plan, 10 year plan, whatever it is. You should be very clear on what you want to do. And we weren't, I entrusted him to do it. And I was young and naive and I, I really was only motivated by going to the studio and creating music. So that was very tough to, to learn when eventually my partner left. And I opened up the books and realized that we were in debt to the tune of maybe 300,000 ringgit. Wow. And that was tough. That was like, oh my God. And okay, then I thought, okay, what's our business model? Hmm. Low, second album. Let's see. First check in, 25,000. How much do we spend on a music video? 50,000, you know, <laughs> on various music videos. And we, we, we so we were, we were in debt and um, we had to crawl out of that. A whole Fat Boys team left. I was left with myself and, and Zayed um, from Disagree. And both of us worked really hard to get out of that. And we were, it was painful. It was really painful because we, we hit rock bottom. I, I, I mean, uh, one of you guys uh, talked recently, I told my, my guitar story, which is basically, our electricity got cut, our phone line was gonna get cut, and Zaid said to me, hey bro, we're, we're down and out. I was like, oh God, no. I said, I said what can we sell? Let's look, let's look around for what we can sell. Hopefully it never happens to you, <laughs> but you know, you look around the office and think, what can we sell? Let's see, <laughs> posters, things like that. So I saw my old guitar, my, my uh, uh, Fender Telecaster, I said, come, let's go down to cash converters. I should have sold it on eBay, but you know, we were desperate. So we went to cash converters, 
on that guitar, the Telecaster was Joe Satriani, Steve sure. Vai, Eric Johnson's uh, signature, and uh, uh, Steve Morse for Deep Purple. These are people that I, w these are great guitar heroes, and I was fortunate to, to, to play with that, to play you know, with them at festivals. Sure. Hang backstage, hey bro, sign my guitar. I thought I'd get 9,000 for it. So I came in the car after we win the cash converters, because I couldn't go in. I just couldn't, I was, I was too devastated. He said, they'll give you 900 bucks. <laughs> I swore a lot, I was like, oh God, that, uh. then I said, just go and do it. So he went in, he came up with 900 bucks. I said, Zayt, here's 200 bucks, go pay the phone bill. Here's 200 bucks, go pay the electricity. Here's 300 bucks for you, because I know I haven't paid him for like two months. I said, here's 300 bucks for you. And with this last 200 bucks, we're going to Subang for a buffet. We went all the way to Subang. I told the waiter, oh, we have 200 bucks. Here it is, we're going to hit that buffet. And we had the biggest buffet we ever had, man. And after that, things kind of started to get good. Okay. So it was a, a lot of about the buffet that got it started going good again. Anytime things go wrong, I go for a big feed. Okay. I, even with my team here, I'm like, oh my God, man, it's so hard. Let's go for a power lunch. You go for a power lunch, you eat big, you think big. Sure. <laughs> of course, after lunch, you, you, know, you, have to, you need a nap probably. But uh, yeah, the, the lunch has helped. Sure. And I'm sure the, you have won the, uh, the awards, the accolades for uh, Evening News. I'm sure that was uh, something that was very big and very interesting. Um, what then uh, made you ultimately decide to move out of the Fat Boys business and uh, became the CEO of Tune Talk? Um, good question. Uh, the answer really is simply Tony Fernandez. Okay. Plus the fact that I've been battling for 10 years in an industry. Uh, you know, Fat Boys was set up... Uh, we were a label, then we diversified into events. We run Malaysia's biggest rock festival, Rock the World. Sure. Rock the World 10 is happening this year. So that's sure. 10 years of, of, of you know, a of, of good, solid 20,000 crowd. We have Best Time in Indonesia. We worked on, we, you know, we co-created my team. We did the whole production of my team. Um, we've done a lot of things. So events, production and all that. Um, but this is, you know, music is still my first love. And, and I, we're in an industry which is really, it's a very tough industry. So someone called Tony Fernandez knocks on my door and says, hey, you know, um, we were out one night. I know he was looking for a CEO uh, uh, months before he asked me. Okay. And then one, and then one night he said, "Jace, you want to come in and, and uh, you know, run Tune Talk." I was like, "But Tony, I'm not a telco guy." And he's like, "Well, I wasn't an aviation guy, <laughs> you know. So why don't you come in and do it?" I, I said, "Well, I need to think about it and see the business plan." But of course, in my head, I was like, "Yes, <laughs> you know, if uh, someone like Tony asks you to join him, you you do not ever close that door." Maybe I'll ask a slightly more difficult question here then. Uh, not all the tune businesses were as successful as we would like it to be, just like Air Asia. And obviously, Tune Talk came after Tune Money. Yeah. And that definitely did not take off as well as Tune Hotels did. Sure. Uh, even though it was something that did not go as well, were you hesitant at first? Or even though you're saying that uh, you were just so excited about it? Um, of course, I was hesitant. I did look at the business model. I thought to myself, well, w one thing about telco is you have to understand telco is a commodity. And it is an understandable product. And it is a highly used product. I mean, uh, you'd, you'd leave home without your wallet, but if you left your handphone, you'd turn around and go pick it up. Um, Tune Money did have a difficult start initially because they are selling financial products. In Malaysia, we tend not to have the disposable income, uh, especially the, un the, the, the underserved market, uh, to use prepaid, pay, prepaid credit cards as much uh, or even to, to pick up insurance. So. Um, you know, if you look at our pre uh, credit card penetration generally, I mean, we have 20, you know, 28 million people in Malaysia. I mean, I think the credit card penetration is only a few million. So, generally, we don't have that sustainability yet for uh, Malaysians to really take out financial products and use it, um, especially with that segment. But I think what Tune Money does offer is it offers uh, a very low barrier to entry. You can get a Visa credit card. You can get low-cost insurance products. So you can get a, a whole bunch of good things, but it takes time to educate people. So, you know, I, I understood that very clearly about Tune Money. Uh, they also, you know, we're also looking at starting unit trust. With Tune Hotels, it's a bit different because Tune Hotels is, you know, it's a it's a cheap hotel room, sure. uh, and you're up there against, uh, you know, the the Mandarin Orientals and the, sure. the, you know, and you still get a great sleeping experience. So there are different businesses. So it wasn't the case, and don't forget, AirAsia also had a pretty tough start themselves. Um, no, no business happens overnight. You're still looking at, I mean, these are really when you're talking about these kind of startups, you're talking about three to five year gestation before it really starts, you know, uh, giving you back uh, the dividends. Sure.